I got it. All right. So today we are going to dive into chapter 23 with hierarchical data. And we are going to introduce a new data structure called lists which hasn't been touched upon in the book yet, and learn how to unnest nested lists, and also get acquainted with the JSON data format. So it's a very interesting topic. So we are using a few packages that we know already, like dplyr and tidyr, but we are also going to use a few things of the per package, the recursive package, it's a package with some data uh, in it, which we are going to use in examples. And the JSON Lite package will help us with JSON data. So lists uh, um, or something else, but uh, let's recap with vectors. Uh, vectors are um, typical for vectors is that all their elements are of the same data type. So it has just a flat structure and vectors do support naming. So here are a few examples of a vector of two elements, two character uh, elements, it's a character vector. Um, then a numeric vector from 70 to 79 and a named vector, which is still a numeric vector with the elements 100 and 200, but they have got a name, mango and banana. So this prints just like this, but it's, it's actually the same uh, thing as another numeric vector. Um, so the, the names are just uh, extra attributes of these elements. Um, however, lists, uh, those elements uh, in the lists, they can be of different data types. So it's very important to, to understand that. So elements can also be any R object. So something that you cannot do with a vector is the store model objects, plots, and other, any kind of R object. So a list can contain anything and it can be heterogeneous with different data types inside the same list. Lists also support nesting, which means that lists can contain other lists as lists are just also another type of R object. So, and the nesting can go deeper and deeper. So lists can contain lists, which can contain other lists and so on. Also, they support naming. So each element can have a name at, at each level, but it's not uh, needed uh, as such. So here's an example already. So it's a list with three elements, a string A, a logical true, and a date. So which we can see here. And if we print it, it's printed as a typical list um, print method. So this means that with the double brackets, the index of the elements of the lists are denoted. So the first element, the second element of the list and the third element, and then each time we have a scalar in this case, which could also be a vector of uh, multiple, uh, with multiple elements. If we look at the structure, this is a convenient way of displaying the contents of this because it's just it needs less lines. So we can see there are three elements. The type of the element is printed as in any STR um, result. And we can see this is a date with this format. And we can use the single bracket um, selection to, sub to subset the list. This means that we, we still get a list, but it's just a shortened version of the same list. So we just ask to get the same list with only the second and the third elements. So we, we just get disposed of the first element. So now the first element of this result is actually what was the second one of this, because this has been omitted. And the second element, is what was here the third in the original version. Uh, if you want to actually not subset the list, but get the element that was inside the list, so the third element of the original list, then you have to use double brackets. So this nicely uh, matches the print method of list. So you just have to take this and then uh, put it next to the name of the list. And then you are actually extracting an element 
So you go in deep, one level deeper, you, you get disposed of the lists uh, context and you just extract that element, which is dates in this case. But lists can also have named elements, so it's then a named list, and they can be nested. So this has the combination, this other list. It has a first uh, simple scholar numeric element, which we which is named as mango, and then in another element, which is named as nice, which is a list in itself with two uh, Boolean um, elements, which have a name and as well. So if we print this, you can see that it prints not with the double brackets because it has names, then it uses the dollar sign with the name, but for the rest it's the same. Um, and for the nested cases, the nesting is printed like this. So you have the, the element at the first level and then it is followed by the element at the second level to print its contents. So this is uh, repeated twice because it has two elements. If we print it with the str, we can also see the indentation to show there is a nesting. So there is a list of two elements, mango and nice, and the nice element has another, is another list which has two elements, sweet and dirty, which have these contents. If you want to extract elements, you can use this um notation uh, so it's actually just taking again from the print methods uh, the elements from that list and then you get indeed because we have taken the list that, that was inside you just see the list contents of that um, list that was one level deeper so with the names sweet and dirty um it's the same if we do this, we can still use this as if it were, were in a named list. And take the second element, it will just return the same. You, with name list, you always have two options. This is all base R um, functionality, because also lists are a base R um, um, object, but it's good to be acquainted with these notations because sometimes they are very efficient. For example, if you want to go two levels deeper, you can um, use the dollar sign two times and get the thing that is indeed indeed uh, there. And the same goes for this. This one gives the list that was nested. So if this is the list that was nested, we can go another level deeper and add the, um, the selector with the first uh, element and then we get the element there. So we don't have to do it in two steps. We can all do it on one line, which is, uh, I think, a powerful way that base R can do this. But lists are often unnamed. So here we have something similar with another listed list, but it's just with uh, without names. So then we get again these indexes in uh, double brackets. And when it prints, it will repeat this selector and then add the index of the element of the nested list. And you can all also see it uh, in this way as a structure. So if we can select it um, like this, and it will print uh, this, and we can also do this again, as we have uh, done with the name list as well. So this demonstrates uh, various ways to, to actually query um, lists and subset them. Uh, perhaps a sidewalk to the data frame, because, yeah, let's, let's create a data frame with the data.frame function. So we have a column A and a column B. So we have data frame with two columns and three rows, uh, a character column and the numeric column. With the is.list function, we can see if is this a list, and it is a list. Why is a data frame a list? So let's have a look at the codes to regenerate that data frame. So with the dput function, we can uh, ask very basic code to recreate the exact same object, but without using the data.frame function. What we can see is that it is 
a list which is constructed as this. This means the first column, a vector. This is just a vector. And the second column, actually, but it's just a vector. So what we have, and then the data.frame class of the object is just attributed inside the structure function. So this is exactly the same as typing data frame around this part. And so it's actually a list of two vectors, which has been told to be and behave like a data frame. So the columns in a data frame are vectors. And we can, it has various methods. So that's why it makes sense to, to have the, that class because then you, it can print like a table. So it's good to know. We can um, use another way to extract elements from a list with the per package. It has the plug function. So let's look at this uh, nested list which we have seen. With the plug function from the per package, you can, you can say, okay, we want a specific element from this other list and take go one level deeper, I want to go into nice, and in nice, I want the element dirty. So this is how it works. So you, you, if you use names, you have to put them in, the, in quotes. So it, it, it extracts this specific element. And so this is what we can see also for a unnamed list. With an unnamed list, well, you cannot use these names, of course, because it has none, but you can use the indices. So I want the second um, element of the top list, which is a list again. And from that list, let's take the first one. So it should be this true. So indeed we get this one. So with plug, you can, yeah, it's it's another syntax. It's it's tidy, the tidyverse approach, you could say, to do um, nested selections. All right, in the book, they also show behavior of the C function on lists or on hybrid um, things. So if multiple elements are provided to the C function, it also tries to flatten them to one level because C, we all we normally use it to just create a vector, but it can also produce other things. So, so it creates, for example, a flat list if one element, not all, but if one element is a list and it can be a hierarchical list and another isn't. So um, one can experiment, of course, with this, but it needs to be uh, hybrid, so to say, the elements of the C function. So this is just a single numeric value, a number. And then here we, we say we want a list. Well, then it will create one flat list and it has concatenated these names, actually. So this is just one name. You don't see a dollar sign here in the middle. It's just the dots. It's it's the it's a name with the dot which it has created itself, and it has. So this is a list with three elements, with just uh, three uh, single values. We can do it for an unnamed um, list as well. So we we then get this. So in the in, in instead of having a two level element, we just um, object we get a, a flat list in this case. So this is also behavior which was um, demonstrated in the book. So once now that we now know about the lists, we can have a look at how we can use tables in combination with lists. So this is what the title title says: tables can have a list column, and just like a data frame. But the tables are just like a data frame, but the columns can also be listed instead of a vector. And so this means that tables can have columns with different data types, nested lists, and so on. So this is very, very flexible with tables. And we will see quite some examples. But this is a simple one to begin with. So we create a table just with the table function. We, we have an a column X, a column Y, and we provide a vector to it as we uh, always do. And then here we make a nested list. We provide a nested list 
pay attention to the fact that at the top level, we have two elements, which is necessary because it is a table with two rows. So the result is that we have a, a table or a data frame, you could say, with two rows. And in the last column, we have these list objects, which are the elements of that list. So as a whole, the Z column is a list, just as the Y column is a character vector and the X column is an integer vector. We can use these tables as before. We can filter, for example, for X is one, and then it will return the first row, which just has this list in the Z column. Well, we cannot really see what's inside, right? And sometimes you want to yeah, see um, what's inside and with the pool function, which you can also use on, on just normal uh, table columns, we can extract the column and get rid of the table framework. It just returns the column. So if we do this and, and we, we print the, 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 the structure with the SDR function, we can just see how this list is built up. It's, it's an, effectively a list of two other lists. The first one has two elements and the second one has three elements, just as we defined here. So we can get this back exactly with the pull function. Uh, let's use the plug function. It does just the same. It uh, takes the first, but we can, of course, as we have seen, because it is a list, we can use the plug function. So um, and we already use it not just on the Z column, but on the data frame, because the data frame is a list. So for the data frame, we say take the Z element, which is the column. So this is already the first step of selection in a list, because this is actually a list. Then we have the list column from which we take the second element, which is this one. And then we want the third element inside, which is number five. So it's confirmed here. But this is how you can use um, block. You can use it directly on a directly on a data frame. So as said, pool just takes one variable as argument, while block can um, reach inside nested uh, structures and uh, go deeper down. Now, the whole aim of this chapter is how to make things simpler. If you have a nested list in a column, it may be because you have got it in such a way, for example, from a web API. And well, you, you want to expand, you want to unnest the structure and make things wider or longer. So there are two important functions inside the tidyr package, unnest longer and unnest wider. Often, earnest longer is the one you want in the case that the list column is an unnamed list at that level, because the unnesting just handles one level. It's important to understand. And the earnest wider is typically used for named lists, but we will um, get to that. So let's let's have a look. So let's create a data frame with an unnamed list column. So the Y column is a list column because we just provide things that it cannot put into a vector in this dribble function. So it has list also from of a different length. And typically in this case, we actually want to have these values under each other. There's no extra information. There are different number of elements in these rows. So what we actually want is get them, uh, make it longer. So that you can see if you print it, you see also the number of elements. What we have to do is um, provide the um, Y column to unnest longer, and then it knows which one you want to unnest, and then it will return this. So that's what we wanted. Let's now create a named data frame like this. And typically for named lists, it will be more systematic. It will have names. So it will those names will return. They have some meaning. So we 
we have a number with A, a number with the name B, and it's, it's repeated. So actually, this is more typically variables for a data frame. So we actually would like to have an A column and a B column in this case, instead of just the Y column that puts them together. If you print this, you get the named list. You, you can see that it is a named list as well. So that's quite handy. Uh, when unpacking in multiple steps, you can each time print it and see, oh, it's a named list. So with a fixed number of elements among the rows, so we probably want to make it wider. So a nesting, a named list column, usually you want to make it wider and the names will become the column names. Of course, you already know by now that we will go, we'll use a nest wider on the Y column and then we get indeed what we wanted. So this is the other way around. So this was just, yeah, one level of nesting. Um, let's have a look first at some special cases because in, for example, in this case, we have two list columns. So if we print it, you see a Y column, which is a list, and a Z column, which is a list. But as we can see here from this structure, from this structure, there's some relationship between the Y and the Z and the Z. So the element, there are two elements here, two elements here. So you could say, okay. Probably the A1 corresponds to that A1, that this A2 corresponds to that A2, and the same for the Bs here. So what we actually want, uh, it's unnamed list. So in the book and also in these examples, it's always very consistent. Unnamed list, we will use a nest longer. For named list, we will use a nest wider. So in this case, we want to get it um, in the long format, but of course with the A1 next to the capital A1, etc. How should we do this? We have to provide to the unnest longer, we have to provide these names uh, inside the C function so that it is combined. And then it will know, okay, I have to unnest this together. Another example, if you have an, a heterogeneous uh, list column, with which I mean that the elements themselves are not just of the same data type. So it's okay to have different number of elements in these two lists. We, we, we could normally just put them under each other, but we cannot do that in a simple vector if the data types are different. So what will happen if we do an S longer on this uh, structure? We can see that it does flatten the elements, but since the data types are different, so we, we just get a, a numeric, a character, a logical, and a numeric again, but it keeps them as a list column. It's just an elongated list, a flattened list. But it has to uh, remain a list because, um, yeah, the data types are different among the rows, but it can do this. Oh, yeah. So if you want to recycle the original variable name with unnest wider, because remember, if you don't, if you just do unnest wider, yeah, the name Y has gone because in the Y we had the A and the B names and these have become the new columns. But it might be that the Y name contains some information you want also to keep in the column names that you are getting in the end. So, yeah, that's what we have. Y column with the A and B. And if you want to get this together, you have to use the names set arguments to keep the Y name. So then it will use the Y, it will, it will retain the Y at the underscore in this case. This comes from the name set arguments and then add the names of the named list elements. So this is also handy, you know. Okay, so now we are going to apply this to some more involved cases, some examples from the recursive package. So the repos object, for example, it's a deeply nested list. The 
GOT chars, it's uh, relational data, which we'll come to in a minute. And the GMAP cities, again, a deeply nested table. And let's have a look at what these data structures look like. So the GH repo, it's a list. And with the SDR function, we can say, well, I know it's very complex, but just show me up to level four and don't go deeper because then otherwise you have a very long output. You can also say, well, for each list that you encounter, I only want to see the first two. I, I just want to get a general idea of um, the structure, how deep it goes or what is inside. So this is what we then get in this case. So at the top level, it's a list of six elements. So the first two are printed here. Um, and so these six elements is each time a list of 30 other elements. So actually this is about GitHub repository information. It's of six users, 30 repositories per user. And then for each repository, then we go one level deeper, there are 68 attributes such as the ID and many others, because 68 is quite long. Um, unfortunately, with this SDR function, we cannot uh, vary this, this amount of um, elements per level. I, at least I did not find that, but this is more easy to look at than if these were 68 uh, elements, of course. Uh, we can have a look at what is. Let's let's just go inside, and this goes up to the repository level, and then of the names of this list, then we can see the sixty-eight names of the contents of so the, the names of those attributes. So which they contain owner, uh, they contain various URLs uh, if it has issues, etc. And let's go one level deeper. Oh yeah, the owner. What's that? Oh, it's another list. So if you have the owner, which we hadn't uh, looked at, it's another list. It has all various attributes that relate to the owner, the name, and the ID of the owner, and then various URLs, which you can uh, can you, you can consult and etc. Or use whatever. All right, so that's the type of information. And now we actually want to get this in a simple data frame uh, for a subset of the attributes, so to say. And we don't want everything and we don't want a hundred columns, but we want the things that we need in a data frame. Well, here I've just put the entire pipeline but in practice, you, you would do this step by step and just see, okay, do I get a named list or do I get an unnamed list? If, we, if I get an unnamed list, okay. In this case, then we do a list longer. Then I get a named list. Oh yes, those are the 68 attributes which have names. Okay, then we use, use a list wider. Huh. 68 columns, uh, that's too much. We select just the ones that we want, uh, like uh, ID, the full name, the owner, and the description of that repository. Uh-huh, all right, uh, let's do that. But the owner column, it's still a list column because each owner has 17 attributes. Well, and it's a named list, the, the one we have seen here. Uh, yeah, apply NS wider and use this underscore so to so that we can still see these are owner attributes. And then we get this. So we have the ID, the full name, and then those 17 attributes for owner and then that description. So we have now just a single data frame with 176 rows for all um, users and repositories. So each line now is just a repository with these selected attributes. So it, it's doable, uh, so to say, to, to explore this type of complex structures and to simplify them with these excellent functions. Let's have a look at an other example. This is the got chars uh, object. So let's have the documentation here. So it's 
info on the point of view characters from the first five books. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's so it's, it's a, the game of thrones. And well, we have attributes of characters in this series. Let's, let's see. So we have 30 elements. I think these are characters, right? Yeah, because for each character, we have the name and also other attributes. So we have 18 attributes per character and there are 30 characters inside this list. So this is again, using the same trick and we there will be most probably uh, elements which are again a list, but we have which we don't uh, dive into because we just ask to go uh, two levels deeper, two levels deep and no, not deeper. So we uh, make a table of this. So we create because this is just a list. We we create we put this inside a table as a list column, and then we can already see. Okay, there are thirty rows, so thirty elements which are named lists. As these are unnamed uh, named lists, sorry, uh, we have to use unnest wider to see the content. So now we have the 18 columns that are connected to uh, each character. So there are 30 characters with 18 attributes, but we can see there are lists among these, which have multiple or compound information. There are multiple here. We can select those by with the select function and using the where is dot list helper which uh, actually uses the data type to to select columns this is something you can do in any data frame actually this is um quite useful so now we get just eight columns so we have the id of the of the character and then all kinds of yeah, attributes like titles, books, which the character appears in, I guess, TV series, etc. But as you can see, depending on the character, this is another number of elements. So yeah, of course, this is our unnamed lists. So we are already thinking about unnest longer because we want to see all titles, for example, for each ID, but we have two titles, but four aliases, three books. So we cannot just do it all together. What this is actually, what this actually is, it is a kind of simple relational database because we have actually a table of ID with its titles. We actually have a table with ID and its books. So we, we have to, we, we, there's no other way to simplify this than to pull this apart and to regard the ID as the common key between all, the, all those tables. So this is actually interesting to see that you can use, um, yeah, tables with list columns to contain multiple tables that are related with one another, with one another uh, using the ID. So the solution is, is actually clear by now. By now we, we have to just select columns of such a simple table and then do the unnest longer and then do it for each combination separately. So let's do that for one example. So we we already did this. It's, it's just generating the 30 by 18 uh, table. Then we select the ID and titles columns and we apply the unnest longer to the titles column. And then we, okay, we get a single table with IDs and titles. Uh, next to IDs, and then we can do the same for other combinations. And then we have multiple tables which we can join afterwards with uh, the ID column and use join function, for example, to if you want to put it still put it together in one table. All right, so far so good. Uh, the third example it's uh, locations. I mean, locations, it's not inside the recursive package. It's already something I have taken from the book chapter, just to make it a bit shorter and, and concentrate it on, I think, which is the most interesting step. So it, it's, this is an extremely complex um, <laughs> object, 
I think this is this location thing. It's it's at level four or something, and it's still complex in itself. Um, so let's just look how this um, well how these three columns of locations object object look like. We were just using this to work on. So we have two simple uh, vector columns. Uh, so these are character columns, and then we have a geometry column, which is an a list of named lists. All right. So with, with also a very strict structure. So we immediate, immediately think about uh, nesting wider. Well, let's have a look at the structure first. So what we can see of this geometry. Well, what's happening here? If I'm yeah, I'm using base R syntax now. It's just uh, extracting the geometry list and then the first element. So we are looking at how one such named list is, uh, is uh, looks like. So it's a list of four elements. It's named. So what we actually have here, so it's again nested structures uh, all around, but this is some kind of bounding box with latitudes and longitudes uh, in, in opposite corners, northeast and southwest. So it's about uh, an area. It's, a, it's about cities, I guess. Um, we have yeah, a single coordinate, which is inside this um, boundary bounding box. So um, the location. Then I'm not sure what this actually is because the, the contents are the same as the bounce um, element, but it doesn't matter. We will actually play just with the bound the, the bounce element. So what we actually would like to do is um, that for each element of the geometry column, so remind that this was just the first element of the geometry column, for each element, we only want to unnest all the contents of the bounds lists. Or the bounds element actually, and we don't want all this. We just want to say a a nest, yes, but only this. And I want custom column names. I don't want lat long, lat long. It will not work because this is a repetition of the same names. So I have to. I need something that combines this information. And I don't want uh, a long pipeline. I want to do it in one step. Okay, so. We'll need something else actually. Then, well, if we would use a nest uh, wider multiple times, well, it, it would work. And with the names set, it would work, but it would just expand all information. And then you would have to select afterwards. That would work, but it is more complicated. We actually, what we actually want is, is reaching insights and telling which elements we actually want. So, a bit similar as the plug. But then a nesting and creating a table, not just just extracting things one by one. But it's it's a similar, it's it's it's, it's analogous. And for that, we can use tell your hoists. I didn't know this function before, but it's uh, very powerful. So we, we already had this, and we tell hoist, okay, uh, from the geometry column, I want to create four new columns. I, I just named these as such. And then just like with the pluck syntax, we say uh, in the geometry column, the, the element that I want to select is the bounce one. And inside the bounce, I want the Northeast. And inside the Northeast, I want the lat for this variable. Put it in that. And the same for this one, the same for this one. Of course, you have to take care that this is really compatible I mean, it will generate the same number of elements, but that's, this, that's the case here. And well, because the hoist function does not drop this one, it just adds new um, columns. You, you still have to drop this geometry list column if you wanted to get rid of it. And then you really have, just in one step, these um, extracted elements with those names which are unique and all, already self-explanatory. So this is yeah another way of rectangling um, deeply nested lists. OK, so so far for dealing with list columns and lists in, in tables, now we are going to look at the JSON um, structure. So it is a string format 
to store hierarchical data. It's the abbreviation of JavaScript object notation. And it's the format which you will encounter when using web APIs, because uh, data are typically returned as a JSON string. You can, yeah, you can have a JSON string. You can also have a JSON file which contains the string. Important to know, compared to R, you have a more limited set of data types. So the null value, it's, it's miss for, used for missing value. So for R, this is equivalent to the NA value. Then you have three data types that can only represent a single value. So that's string, which for which you always have to use double quotes in JSON. You have number, that can be decimal, integer, or scientific notation. And uh, the infinite or not a number from R are not supported. So it, it's a more limited set, but still it, it's quite, um, yeah, you, you can do a lot. Um, and there's also the Boolean data type. And JSON, it's always lowercase true or false. But we might, this is all wrapped in a string. If you are handling data, which we will see in a minute. And these will actually be the drivers to, to contain multiple uh, things and nested things um, because there are two data types that can contain, multi can contain multiple values. Those are the arrays and the objects. So arrays, you can con consider it like an unnamed list in R and it's it uses the brackets. And so just like list, it can be heterogeneous. Just like list, it can be nested. Uh, and it's it's just like this. So this is uh, combining values of those data types from the previous slides and the objects uh, data type. It's like a named list in R. So it's written with braces, and the names of the list of the of the elements, uh, which we call keys in JSON terminology, they are strings for JSON because it's names. So they must be surrounded by quotes. So we get this. So we get a first element with the name X and the element itself, it's one. And then in a second element, which is named Y and it is the element, it is the value two. And we will be able to use the, those arrays and objects to actually represent data frames and also nested structures. It, it's um, very flexible with these uh, data types and um, Fortunately, there's the package JSON Lite, which has, amongst others, uh, the read JSON and the part JSON function, which uh, take a file path or a string, respectively. So let's have a look. So let's just create a JSON string. It's an array. It has two objects with named elements. So this is already a nested list, so you could see in um, in our parlance. So this is a list of an unnamed list of two named lists. So we have a name and the H element in each of those. So if we parse this and we create a, a table um, with a, a list column from this, then we can see, oh yeah, indeed, we have just a list column with um, two elements, which each time is a named list with two elements. So to handle this in R, we can use the unnest wider and we get this content. So this is what how you would deal with this. Let's have a look at more uh, possibilities because there are actually two ways to encode a data frame as JSON. So either, either you have an object of named columns as you would, well, you could compare this with the table function in R actually. So you, you define a column name and its contents, which actually would represent a vector here with the missing value. And so this is at the top level, a named list because it's defines the columns. So that's important because here we have an unnamed list. Why? Because it defines the rows. So in this case, this is a row with, with the X and the Y value of that row, uh, the X and the Y value of the second row and the X and the Y value of the third row. So these have to be named lists. 
contrary to these, because these are all columns, so these are no need of uh, names, the contents themselves. So here it's just swapping uh, column and row order. So you have to repeat the column names in this case. This You could compare this with the triple function. So if this were the table um, syntax, this would be the triple syntax, which uh, uses the rows to compose um, um, the data frame. So this also um, actually determines how you will deal with the JSON string in R, whether it is composed like this or composed like this. So let's have a look. If it's an object of named columns like this, yeah, you 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 get the structure, a list of lists, all right. So you can use the part JSON to get this unnamed list of two columns. But no, it's a named list, sorry. It's a named list of two columns, which each have their unnamed list contents. So the elements are not rows. So putting them in the list column before doing an S divider must happen in a single row table by using list. We have to use, we have to put lists here because otherwise we, we cannot get this uh, structure. So this is um, typical for this um, yeah, object uh, JSON notation, which has the columns at the top level. Because otherwise you would get the call the first column here and the second column in a in a second row. So and then we cannot deal with that using the unnest functions. So we have to contain them in one uh, single row table, and then we can apply the unnest divider to this. So then create the columns. This is still containing unnamed lists, which are then the vectors, and then we can apply the unnest number on both columns, and then we get the results. So uh, perhaps let me just repeat the same uh, once more, um, because it, it's uh, easy to get stuck, I think. So we have a named list object, which has the columns at the top level. Because these are the columns at the top level, we cannot just assign um, that object, the JSON call uh, object, which is a list, to the X value, we have to wrap it inside list because if we weren't doing that, it, the first column would end up as a first row and the second column would end up in the second row and then we cannot use the unnest functions to unnest wider and this result. So, we have to put it in a list first so that it gets inside one row. And then applying unnest wider will yield the two columns because those that was the first level, but it's a nested list. And we have to apply unnest longer now to just expand the contents of those two columns. So this is how an object um, notation for JSON is um, organized. Actually, more simple is this one. So the triple approach in which you will have to repeat the names of the rows, of the columns, sorry. So this is an unnamed list because the rows are the top level. And then each row contains a named list. So it's an object notation in JSON with the names each time of the column. So of course they have to be the same. So now we have an unnamed list three columns, uh, sorry, an unnamed list of three rows with each row containing a named list. So now, since these are already rows, we can just use and provide this list to table. So we can, okay, that's the JSON row lists. We can just do X is equal to that uh, list. And we immediately have indeed the three elements as rows, which we actually want. And then we only have to do the unnest wider, and then we have the end result. So this is a more simple case. And with that, um, I think we are finished and it's nine o'clock. So at least here, <laughs> it's nine. Um, all right. So any comments or uh, ideas on the other side? Well, first of all, you, I don't know if you have ever considered teaching or if you are a professor at a university, <laughs> but you should definitely consider that because 
every time you explain one of the chapters, I'm like, yeah, I understand everything. I am following perfectly. Like you have like this very, it's one of your superpowers. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, <laughs> thank you Thanks. so much for that because I, yeah, this, um, this is something that I'm, I deal with every day, but there were so many things that I hadn't understood um, how to deal with. And I was, I guess, in a way sort of managing, but now things are so much more clear. This is super useful um, information to know. And I think this chapter is, is key, essentially. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Flores. That's all I wanted well, to say. <laughs> uh, you're, very, you're very welcome. And for me, this is also learning or a way of learning uh, things, having to, yeah, to summarize, to get your head around it, to, to explain it, to someone else, I think it's the best way to learn. Absolutely, yes. totally agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is uh, one reason why we have book clubs, don't we? <laughs> yes, uh, and um, you know, like I say, always say, if you want to learn the thing, that's the one you should choose to present. Don't choose the ones you know really well because that doesn't help. Um, so if it's something you want to learn, and now. If it's something you think you know really well, often it, you'll still learn something <laughs> when you present it. But uh, yeah, uh, very nice. You know, that was very useful. Um, this chapter is like uh, chapter zero of my book. So uh, it's nice to <laughs> see it. Very cool. Oh, nice. All right. I will see everybody on Slack. <laughs> All right. See you next week, you guys, and um, have a lovely long weekend. I hope everybody. Well, not you, Flores. Sorry, just because <laughs> you. I'm so sorry about that. You have to go to work on Monday. We don't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. All right. See you next Bye. week.